evening and welcome to everyone here and all of you who have logged in from home for Chalak Prize 2023. I am Sunny Singh, the director of the prize. We have a lovely program lined up for today. However, a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. The online version of this event will be live captioned, so please enable yours if you need it. The viewing links will be available for 48 hours after the event on catch up. Before we proceed tonight, we want to honor a brilliant writer, a dear friend, and 2022 Chalak Prize judge, Stephen Thompson. Stephen is perhaps best known for his BAFTA winning Sitting in Limbo, but he also wrote three extraordinary novels, Toy Soldiers, Missing Joe, and No More Heroes. Judging the Chalak Prize in 2022 was Stephen's final literary commitment. He had an indomitable will and sent in his views by, on, on submissions by email and kept his camera off during the judges meeting. He also cracked jokes about Darth Vader, but we shall leave that be. <laughs> Stephen passed on the night of the Jalak Prize Awards in May 2022. He is much missed. This evening, we start off with readings from writers shortlisted for Jalak Prize and for Jalak Children's and Young Adult Prize. The full versions of these readings can be found on our YouTube channel, along with many more, so do look them up. This will be followed by a short conversation with our Chalak Artist in Residence for 2023, Sharon Adebisi and Diane Ewan, chaired by Emma Hill, who was longlisted for our inaugural Chalak Children's and YA Prize in 2021. You will also get your first Chalak, which is Hindustani for a glimpse of the wonderful works Sharon and Diane have created as trophies for the winners of 2023. For those of you in the room, you can see them on both sides of the stage. <laughs> the full video of the conversation will again be posted on our YouTube channel. We will then move to a panel with some of our current and former judges. This short discussion will be chaired by one of our inaugural judges, Catherine Johnson, who also helped create the judging criteria for the prize. She'll be joined by Anthony Vani Kapildeo, one of the judges for Chalak Prize 2023, and Yaba Bechu, judge for this year's Chalak, one of the judges for Chalak Children's and Young Adult Prize. Bookshops are essential to bringing our long list to readers across the country. And a huge shout out to over 150 independent bookshops who have taken our point of sale material this year and champion Chalak Prize shortlists in their communities through displays, podcasts, Spotify lists, events, and much more. You'll run into some of them at the end of this, this program. Also, thank you, Blackwells, who have launched a shadowing scheme with two booksellers reading all our long-listed titles to review and promote them. Gratitude to Foils. Finding our long-listed books right at the front of the shop has been a dream come true. Thank you to Blackwells, Waterstones, and Bookshop.org who have supported and promoted our long lists and short lists on social media, newsletters, and in-store. Further information on Chalak Prize celebrations, including book giveaways, video clips of shortlisted writers, and much more, can be found on social media via our hashtags Chalak Prize 23 and Chalak Prize. And if you're tweeting or Instagramming or TikToking, please use those hashtags. Uh, so pour yourself a favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy the show. My favorite daydream of myself in the future is when I see myself as Pete Burns walking to get a can of Coke from the shops. I do not mean that I look like a version of Pete Burns. I mean that I literally am him. Pete Burns, may he rest in peace, was an androgynous icon to me, yet to many his face was confusing. Heavy amounts of plastic surgery, razor sharp eyebrows, and a still harsh, deep accent. Often he said, I'm just Pete, when I asked questions about himself as well as saying he was just a man. Yet in my imagination, it is the just Pete that sticks in a way that our imagination sometimes wants to make things simpler for our own benefit. My version of him has him walking to the shops just screaming I'm Pete to anyone who dares to challenge him. I think it is the just Pete of him that makes me daydream of being him. The way in which through surgeries, cosmetic procedures and glam, he almost avoided the need to gender, instead forming another category within his body 
the kind of image that makes saying you look like an alien the largest compliment possible. I find it an admirable daydream. The perseverance, work and strength it takes to have work done to your body is not lost on me, even more so now that I spend most hours of the day thinking about it. And to land in a space where others do not know where to place you, yet an intentional extreme of that feels liberating. I daydream of having so much plastic surgery done to my face that none of my phones can recognise me. That all the laughs and heckles I received in the past on leaving the house would at least now make sense. It does not feel sad. Rather, I hear myself saying, before you treated me like I was not human because I was gender non-conforming. Well now look, I've spent all this money to look like I'm not from this planet. Laugh all you want, because maybe now I'm in on the joke. We called it the dulling. It had been creeping in for such a long time and had started so gradually that most people barely even noticed. Perhaps they didn't want to see. There are things going on in here that shouldn't be happening. Some bits of grey creeping in that you might see. See if you can spot it. No one knew what to do except carry on as normal as if we could ignore the problem away. As the dulling spread, people felt sad and angry. They blamed each other and there were terrible arguments. Hurt replaced harmony, neighbours became enemies, but this didn't solve anything. When the last drop of colour finally left our planet, the people in charge shrugged their shoulders and said nothing could be done. Ring, 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 the silver corded phone that sits to the left of the counter, worn from years of being picked up and slammed down, is shrilling again. I hastily pick it up. Hello, lucky star, how may I help you? I automatically regurgitate in my sing-song takeaway order voice. A delivery? Sure, can I have your address please? 34 Healer Escob. And what's your phone number in case anything happens and we need to contact you? 01901, yep, 218968, okay. And what would you like to order today? A special charmaine? Yep. But with no prawns? Okay. Black bean beef? Uh-huh. Two bags of chips? Yep. A portion of chicken balls? What sauce would you like with the chicken balls? We do barbecue, curry or sweet and sour. Sweet and sour sauce. Okay. Anything else with your order? No? That's it? That'll be £17.20 and plus the extra pound for delivery. So that's £18.20 in total. Your order will arrive roughly in... I kept the handset with one hand and turned my head round to check the rustic wood-framed clock on the wall. In half an hour's time to an hour's time? Okay, thank you, bye. As soon as I placed the handset down on the receiver, ring, 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 ring. Hello, lucky star, how may I? Ni hao, followed by barely covered up sniggers in the background. Hello, I asked tentatively. Ching chong, ching chong. <laughs> There's now a guffawing as the hilarity of the situation seems to be too much to cope with. Huh? What? Wait a minute. It started to dawn on me what's happening. Egg fried rice, please. Come again? I decide I'll give them one more chance. Me so horny. Me love you long time. I slam the chunky handset down and throw it across the counter in rage. Not again. If I ever find out who that punk is, I swear I'll look for him, find him and set my dad on him. I think to myself, this happens every other bloody night and I'm getting really tired of the prank calls. I can't stop thinking about him, Jackson blurts out suddenly. It takes me by surprise, but I'm relieved that someone's finally said something. It kind of feels like the weight's been lifted almost. I keep replaying what happened, Jackson continues, over and over. I couldn't sleep last night because I just kept seeing him on the floor like that. What if, Jackson pauses, what if he ends up dying? We wouldn't have just seen some kid get stabbed. We would have seen him get murdered, right in front of us, like it was nothing. He puts his head in his hands. The last thing he said to me was to tell his mum that he loved her. I don't even know who she is. I don't even know where he lives. What if he never gets to tell him that himself? Jackson sneaks us a glance. And I can't help but feel guilty. I was there at the tram stop, and I saw it all. 
The guys come running out the Arndale Centre. The knife. I saw it happen and I still couldn't do anything. I couldn't make myself run over to him. Not like Chantel did. Or Jackson. I swallow hard and I try to block out the memory of Shaq's cries and the screams of everyone around us. All I did was phone the ambulance again. I should have done more. I should have been less of a coward. Seventeen seventy-five. Forty-six years old. Time away from one's diary is as valuable as a little time away from one's lover. Absence not only softens the tender feelings toward the beloved other, it also provides the benefit of perspective that renders the object of affection so much more precious and beautified. So too, with quill, ink and leaf, I reunite my body with my mind, and the pleasure this act gives me has grown rather than diminished. For I speak and write to purpose now. I seek to lay forth a history that speaks of all the truths of my life up to this present day, to survey, like the architect of my own life, the line I have followed that brought me here, my history not chaotically rendered, as in my earliest diary entries, no, as I see them now, put together to make sense of the whole. This for you, my son, William Leach Osborne Sancho. Born last Friday, the 20th day of October, exactly at half past one in the afternoon, my second son, my only living son. Bow star, check. Hoodie, check. Hair done in a tight low ponytail, double check. Bravery, gulp. I stand in the hallway staring dead ahead at the front door. Once I step through, there's no going back. I wipe my sweaty hands against my leggings as I inhale deeply and focus forward. Today is the first day of training, the first step in actually becoming an umbra tamer one of the protectors of our city and the first port of call for anyone who needs help beyond the walls. Soon I'll be one of them, if I pass my training that is. I hear a chuckle behind me and turn as a gentle hand rests on my shoulder. Dad smiles softly and runs his hand down my arm until he reaches mine and squeezing it. You'll be fine baby girl, I promise. I search his brown eyes, the very same eyes that me and Lucas have. There's nothing but honesty in them. Yeah, I can't stop my arms from shaking. Yeah, I'll be fine. I'm only going to be facing a, a creature capable of tearing me in two. But yeah, no big deal, right? When I was younger, all I ever wanted to be was an umbra tamer. But after what happened in the nightmare planes, I never want to step foot out there again. Be a stinking tamer or come anywhere close to a wild umbra. I'm the only kid in Nubis being forced to be a tamer. And it sucks. I just want to go to normal school, to be normal. I guess that's not an option when your parents are the most famous tamers in the city though. Yay, for me. <laughs> the only good part about being a tamer is the martial arts training that comes with it. But you do that at normal school too, so what's the point? Besides, if the other kids saw what I did three years ago, they wouldn't dare dream of being a tamer either. Darwin. Some days, Darwin can't work out how long he in the city. The calendar say nearly two months, but Fidelis have a different kind of time. The hours longer, the days deeper, and digging graves and lowering coffins in the ground is like watching whole lives fast forward beginning to end. Fidelis make him adopt its rhythm instead of his own. And it's not just Fidelis. Port Angeles crackle and spit like oil on a fireside. And he start to like how he could disappear into it. Just another one of the many somebodies that come here for whatever it is they come for. He learning that even death in Fidelis does work in sync with the city. Payday? That mean hospital, courthouse and graveyard. 
heavy rain, that mean road accident for so, and they're too busy to even laugh and old talk. Then it's have other times when something starts to ripple through the city. The wrong man get killed, the blocks get hot, and there's only sirens blaring out through the night. Them times they, live, they dig in grave three, four a day and have to send for temporary workers so they could do more than one funeral same time. But now, as it get closer to November around All Souls Day, it's like the dead and the living come to a kind of a truce. Today, the Palais arrived to celebrate Granny's 75th birthday. And when I say celebrate, what I actually mean is compete for her attention and very occasional approval. When I hear the cars on the driveway, I feel a momentary jolt of reality. My family are about to descend like a swarm of locusts intent on destruction. And I can feel my neighbour's disapproval before I even see it. Too many of us in this little village. Too many non-white faces, too many accents, too many unknown fragrances and colours. And the noise, the noise of three extra cars with six extra adults and eight extra kids. A scary amount of different for this little outpost of East England. And it's not that they hate us, in fact we could even on occasion call them friends. But there's something about the change in atmosphere when they feel they're close to outnumbered. When suddenly we are less of a minority. Unnan, this is my big uncle, my dad's younger brother, arriving with Auntie Delia and his three children, Joseph, Peter and Esther. Peter is 12, the same age Amos would have been, sweet and clever, while Esther is six and quiet as a mouse. Joseph, their elder brother, is 15 and the worst kind of bully. Unnan, this is my dad's youngest brother or little uncle arriving. His wife is Christine and their children are Hope and Grace. The product of a devout Catholic marriage, their names hide much of their personal blemishes, i.e. Hope is vain and Grace is mean and occasionally the roles reverse. Hope is 16 and annoyingly beautiful, as in beautiful, but mostly annoying. Grace is 11, but showing worrying Hope-type tendencies for the future, both in the looks and attitude department. I stalk a woman on the internet who is sleeping with the same man as I am. Sometimes when I'm too quick to look at her stories, I block her temporarily so she doesn't know I absentmindedly refresh her page 15 times a minute while Netflix plays in the background on my laptop, my stomach flipping sick with delight when her profile picture is ring red. She has tens of thousands of followers, is verified and is the daughter of someone famous in America. An endless stream of white people fawn in the comments under her posts. She has opinions about household objects which I've never given a thought to before, Firm tastes in the types of beeswax candles to burn, lays exquisite cloth on her table in anticipation of dinner. Knows where to buy limited edition pottery from well-regarded potters. She will happily spend $300 on a vase where she displays really, really organic fennel flowers, by which she says there is organic and then organic. Buys a $500 ring for herself during a time of financial strife for the rest of the world and shows it off in a selfie. She uses a filter on Instagram, which burns up her flaws. It thins down her cheeks and radioactively erases the two thick lines shaped like spooning Vs, which are carved in her forehead and erupt from her face more prominently when she raises her eyebrows. A sick sense of satisfaction rips through me when I see them. She orders takeout from the right restaurants, seems to know everyone in the higher echelons of society, is accepted into the kinds of circles which seem out of reach to me. Sometimes I wonder, if I ever met her, what would I say to her? Would I tell her of our connection? Would I tell her I know where she lives? Would I tell her how I guess that she broke up with her boyfriend? Would I tell her I know why the tone of her stories changed? Because the man we are both sleeping with, the man I want to be with, shamed her for exploiting her privacy the last time they saw one another. Would I tell her that I know who her ex-husband is? I've seen his new family and he seems happy now, happier than the photos I've seen of the two of them. Would I tell her I know who all her friends are and I watch their stories too? Would I tell her I screenshot the photos she takes of herself and study her face so intently sometimes I fear I've picked up some facial expressions or tonal inflections from her because I listen to her speaking with her father on YouTube over and over before I go to sleep? Would I move in closer to smell her and feel what he felt when he felt her? Would I taste the inside of your mouth to find out what was so compelling? Would I press into you? I want to know exactly how your body moves when you are turned on, 
to know for myself why he cancelled fucking me. The so fuck you. When Himura was nine years old, his hometown was attacked by a giant tortoise. Whenever he told this story, he made sure to emphasise the giant part. Tortoises don't seem frightening until you're leaning out of your window, staring up at the craggy face of a reptile the size of a mountain. Trees grew from the back of its shell. Its head was covered in moss. Its claws, eating up the ground and a at an alarming speed, was stained with mud and the remains of animals it had trampled beneath its feet. Roads buckled, the earth shook. Those who weren't fast enough to escape were crushed beneath its body. Himura remembered the way his fingers gripped the windowsill as the tortoise barreled through the village. He remembered staring up at its wrinkled face as monstrous as the living earth. Beneath the layers of soil covering its shell, he could still see the yellowing folds of its body. Paper. The tortoise was made of paper. A perfect construction of crimp folds and reverse pleats, so beautiful, Himura could only stare at it in wonder, even as it thundered towards his house. The tortoise's foot swung over the roof of his home, but the snap of wooden beams and the crash of the collapsing ceiling never came. He could not remember the exact order of what happened next, only the sound and the heat. A whistle screamed above him as something struck the tortoise's back, exploding into flames that licked up the creature's body faster than wildfire. When Himura looked up again, Dark shapes filled the sky. Rearing its head back in agony, the tortoise burned and the ground moved beneath Himura's feet, jolting him out of his memories. Train Triolet, 1646 to Brighton. I won't blow you up because I'm brown. Oh, twitchy woman who grassed up my shopping. I went to the loo not to twiddle my belt. I won't blow you up because I'm brown. Terrorists don't tend to buy Kath Kidston unless I am a clean skin moron. Because I'm brown, I won't blow you up. Oh, native woman who grassed up my shopping. Rooted. Is it you, or you, or you who will bolt into my gaze, my ear, my catastrophic throat? Can you hear me on the ninth floor peering at you from my tower block window here? This gilded cube is where my Marseillaise, my marching mind seeks minds of all calamities. The wincing pulp, pupating pipes and risers, aluminium denture boxes, thrashing life is here. Cracks in my ear. I thought of you. You rang. You heard my song. My jana, gana, mana, gonga, knavish trickster pulse. A signal out of concrete. Neurons sparking down the network, popping in my head like mustard seeds in oil, like faulty fuses, siren screams. And you, down there, bedeviled and believed. When I'm fossilised in concrete, cradled through the countless hours, lusting after Georgian stucco, quite barbaric tyranny, you cut me off. But still my chest frays open, bivalved wires spitting bloodish. For your connects, I wait. Once... In a tiny village in India, there was a boy who loved to paint. He lived with his grandfather in an old house full of paintings. First, the boy painted with his fingers. He printed with marigolds, beetle leaves and coconut shells. As he got bigger, he painted with brushes made of sticks with strips of cloth, reeds or jasmine flowers wrapped around the ends. 
the village children would peep through the windows to watch them paint. Sometimes the boy's grandfather would invite them to join in. The boy and his grandfather did everything together. They grew bananas, pineapples and jackfruit and sold them in the local market, shared sticky, juicy mangoes with the village children and made paper boats for them to float down the street in the monsoon rain. They read books and picked out what they'd paint the next day. When the rains had gone, every night they lay on their rooftop beds and watched the stars until they fell asleep. They didn't have much, but they had each other. Don't ever leave me, the boy would say. I won't, his grandfather would reply, holding the boy so tight that his bones would hurt. But one day, he did. Hi, I'm Emma Hill, and I'm here today to talk to our two wonderful artists, Sharon Adebisi and Diane Ewan, who are creating our prizes this year, or Jallet Prize 2023. Um, hello to you both. Hi. Hello. Um, Sharon, I'm going to come to you first. So tell us a little bit about the work you created and what it represents. Okay, so this piece, I'll probably hold it up, actually. Yeah. So I haven't finished it yet, <laughs> but um, it's called Blessed. And the reason why I created it was because at the time that I, I sort of was commissioned to do this, I wasn't really going through a great time, but I knew that I knew where I wanted to be. And as I said, you know, my work is like a journal of my experiences. I don't think I even said before, I'm a painter. I use acrylic on canvas paints. And I just wanted to paint a picture of where I want to be in the future. You know, so that by the time I finish the painting, I can look back and be like, oh, am I here now? Am I am I a better place than when I was when I started this journey? So that's why it's called Blessed, just to kind of like represent that where I'm I'm heading towards. And I feel like slowly I'm, I'm getting to that level. You can see the lady there. It's meant to represent myself, you know, with some watermelon juice, which will be painted in there. Just like, you know, enjoying life, like looking, looking glamorous, feeling good. Um, and I just feel like if I kind of paint that, I will feel that, you know, in due time. So that's the meaning behind this painting. Oh, I was going to ask you if it was a if it was a self portrait, and then yes. it is. So, you, did you say it's acrylic on canvas? Yep. Great. Thank you, Sharon. I'm just going to come over to you now, Diane, to talk to you a little bit about the work that you created for the prize. I don't know if you've got it there or I'll if you can see it. On. Oh, I'll great. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you can see it properly because I've got a bit of a shine. Yeah, that's that's fab. If you just maybe tilt it slightly, yeah, that's great. Okay, so mine, as I said, I'm a children's picture book illustrator. And for me, I drew on um, like the brief because I'm used to using briefs um, in terms of my artwork. Um, and among the things that um, Sunny sent over, she sent some words. So what I did was I pop them, I don't know if you can see, pop them on there and I read the brief and I just wrote out words that come into my mind regarding you know how I might approach it and she'd put um, the, the artist should really draw on histories um, things that traditions that are close to them and so I'd written a few things that um, that might be for me and the first thing that came into my head was the large um, Notting Hill Festival that the West Indian community uh, created in way, way back in the 60s or probably even further. And I thought um, I'd go, I'd sort of put that as a basis because within the, the Caribbean community, music is quite large and food is quite large. Um, so I thought I can do the I can do the music one a bit better. So the girl that is in here has got on she's got a large it's like a large headpiece that you see the ladies wearing at Notting Hill and then I thought okay we've, we've got this um how can I make it more specific to the Jalak and what the Jalak's trying to achieve um and the word glimpse was there and I sort of honed on that I thought this child will be looking into the future to see where she's going and 
the pen and the book indicates her thought processes, probably writing a book, writing an essay. And that's how the idea sort of came about. And so I'm quite happy that I got to sort of encapsulate it in one image. Um, and as Sonny will tell you, it probably wasn't my very first image that I'd sent it. So and I went back to it and I thought, okay, we need to be more specific, give it more of a oomph and more meaning. Uh, and so I came up with this, this particular one. Great. Well, both of your profiles are featured on the Jalop website so people can check you out there and follow your work. Thank you both so much for your time. All right, we're moving now to a panel, a quick discussion, short and sweet, chaired by Catherine Johnson, who was one of our inaugural judges. And she's joined by Anthony Vani Capaldo, one of the judges for Jalak Prize 2023, and Yaba Betu, a, one of the judges for this year's Jalak Children's and Young Adults Prize. Hello, um, I'd like to introduce Anthony and Yaba. And I've only met Anthony today, but I've known Yaba for some time. And I've known the Jalak Prize from when it began. And I've known Sunny from then, and we are birthday twins, and I have had two drinks, which is my limit. But <laughs> I, I was a judge. I was honoured to be a judge the first year of the JALAC and the second year, in fact. And what I'd like to know is what it was like being a judge this year. I'm going to ask Anthony first. So it was tremendously exciting being a judge because finally I felt as if... Uh, all the books I wanted and hoped that might exist in the world one day really were existing and they were arriving through the letter flap like an endless succession of Christmases. Uh, the only difficult thing was keeping my friends out of my flat uh, because I was rearranging them into meaningful stacks for months. <laughs> and uh, Yabba, uh, you were judging the children's in YA um, and it's always lovely, isn't it? Did you have rows? No, we didn't. We were actually very consensual and um, agreed on, on many of our choices. It was a remarkable experience, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Like Anthony said, it's like Christmas, an endless Christmas. And, you know, I got to the stage where my whole study was full of books to such an extent that when I had breakfast one day, I tripped over one of the piles and the porridge went splattering all over the place. But apart from that and a few bruises, it was an experience of a lifetime. I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to ask Anthony one more question. Do you think, did it feel hopeful that the amount of books and the sort of books that were coming to be judged? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was it was more than hopeful it was ex, it was exhilarating uh the talent on offer in all sorts of genres picture books middle grade young adult it was phenomenal and i read some really 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 wonderful stuff and saw some amazing picture books and i feel that i'm a better person as a result well that's fantastic uh, I'm going to turn to Anthony now, because you were judging the adult section, weren't you? And what did you feel? Did you feel that it, it, was, it felt like something opening up? Or? It very much felt like something opening up, and what it felt like opening up was truth. Because truth isn't something that is unitary or monolithic. Truth is something that is wild and multifaceted. And each of these books, whether it was a book on mathematics or a cookbook or self-help book or lots of other things on our numerous alternative long lists that we made along the way, these just opened up truthful ways of being in the world and knowing the world mm -hmm. that I'm desperate for readers to connect with. That's, fa that's fantastic. I, I, I think I want to say one thing about the prize in itself, which has been going for, as I said, seven years. I think it's... It's made, uh, it's made the playing field leveller. 
Yeah. It's made people more aware mm. through bookshops. Even I live, I don't live in London, but our local independent bookshops, it runs the Jalak Prize shortlist. And they're there in the window, my little seaside town. And I think it's such a fantastic thing. It's made a huge difference. So thank you, Jalak yes. Prize people. Yes, yes. Thank, so thank you, you so much. <laughs> We'll go now, but okay. I mean, I know that the judges know who's won. I don't know. I know nothing. I know nothing. You know nothing? Oh. <laughs> I think it's fabulous. Do you want the mic back, Sonny? No, I think you can just, you can just leave from there. <laughs> okay. I think it's, it's, it's quite... Thank you for that. I, I'm, I'm very aware of that we are on very, very tight schedule, thanks to the British Library. So um, I'll pick up again. Um, welcome back. And a quick reminder that we can be found uh, on our website, jellockprize.com, and on social media with hashtags jellockprize23 and jellockprize. Again, if you're tweeting, Instagramming, TikToking, whatever your poison may be, please go ahead and um, use those. So um, a little bit now to the more formal part. Um, the Jalak Prize exists to celebrate the rich array of exceptional work from writers of color in Britain, be it fiction, nonfiction, short stories, graphic novels, or poetry. A sister award, the Jalak Children's and YA Prize, was announced in 2020 with the first award made in 2021. Both awards are open to self-published writers. Open to a broad church of genres and forms, both award a thousand pounds to the winner, as well as a unique work of art, which you had a glimpse of, created by artists chosen for the annual Chalak Art Residency. But first of all, I would like to thank our partners who make this prize and celebration possible. Thank you to our anonymous benefactor who provides the prize checks for the winners. A thanks also to our anonymous sponsor who funds the annual Jalak Artists in Residence. Thank you to the British Prize who have hosted our globally available online awards since 2021 and are providing today's hybrid celebration with an in-person reception as well as a globally streamed live event, live streamed event. We're delighted to partner with the London Library. This partnership grants all shortlisted writers one year complimentary membership. The winners receive two years of complimentary membership. We are delighted to be able to share possibly the most writerly of libraries in the world with more of our communities. There is a special place in our hearts for National Book Tokens with whom we have partnered for the last three years. Our partnership means that bookshops up and down the country support our shortlisted titles with creative in-store displays and promotions across websites and social media. This year, Waterstones, Foils, Blackwells, Bookshop.org, and over 150 independent bookshops are promoting our shortlists. So thank you for that. A huge shout out. Those of you with fruit phones, a huge shout out to Apple Books who have Jalak Prize curated lists. We also want to thank the bookseller for their constant and much needed support and for hosting, again, a very loud table at this year's Nibbies. <laughs> Jalak Prize is run entirely by volunteers. If you are with us in person, you will see most of the team here. But a huge thank you to Jamila Ahmed, Tashmia Owen, Hamza Jahanzeb, and Kate Birch, and the many more wonderful folk who prefer to be prefer to be unsung heroes. Also, thank you, DJ Shy Guy, who has prepared a special DJ set for, our, for this evening. And now to the business at hand. As you may have noticed, the Jalak Art Residency, which annually commissions a unique work of art by an artist of color to serve as trophy for the prize, are both here for your perusal. In 2021, the residency was expanded to, to an annual commission for an illustrator of color. The aim of the residency, as with the prize, is to shine a light on artists of color in contemporary Britain, to recognize their creative output, and to celebrate their works. 
This year's winners will take home unique works of art created by Sharon Adebisi, who created the trophy for the Jalak Prize, and Diane Ewan, who created the trophy for the Jalak Children's and Young Adult Prize. However, moving now, aware of the time, to the shortlists. Six books are selected for each prize, and this year they showcase a wide range of genre. The 2023 Jalak Prize shortlist comprises of None of the Above by Travis Alabanza. A beautiful book of intense vulnerability, generosity, and humor. An anti-memoir. This is a thoughtful, illuminating deliberation on self, identity, and humanity, told with commendable control and a wry, almost painful wit. Takeaway by Angela Hoy. It's a memoir. With with action thriller level drama, insights into China and Hong Kong, teenage angst, and gradual maturing peace. This book will make you cry, nod, laugh, gasp, and finally savor the prose. Patterson Joseph's The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho <laughs> is an is an incredibly accomplished debut, which breathes life into a fascinating and important historical figure with sharp wit, compassion, and tenderness. When We Were Birds by Ayanna Lloyd Thunder <laughs> is a triumphant debut. The lush setting instantly pulls the reader into a thrilling story told in lyrical and accomplished prose. I'm a Fan by Sheena Patel. is razor sharp and highly addictive. This is an eye-popping debut, a neon-lit announcement for a brilliant new voice in contemporary fiction. Hiding to Nothing by Anita Patti <laughs> is a fearfully and wonderfully formed poetry collection that is at once profound, challenging, and absolutely exquisite. Now the Chalak 2023 Jalak Children's and Young Adults Shortlist. In Our Hands by Lucy Farford. <laughs> it's a clarion call for change, which confirms that if we work together, share ideas, and pool our dreams, we're never too small to make a difference. When Our Worlds Collided by Daniel Jawanda. <laughs> A powerful and devastating story that deals with injustice in a balanced and nuanced way. Its exceptional characters define and shape the story with little tendrils of anger, frustration, hope, and joy. Mia and the Lightcasters. <laughs> by Janelle McCurdy, it's a fast-paced fantasy with mythical beasts, martial arts, and humor. This is an exciting debut which taps into the interests of young readers, especially gamers, and those who want to be transported to a totally different world. Ellie Pillai is Brown by Christine. <laughs> Christine Pillai Nyagam is an expertly created YA rom com with multi layered themes and its unique, own unique soundtrack. The voice of the main character is brilliant and will make you root for her all the way through. Rebel Skies by Anne Salin <laughs> is an outstanding debut with vivid characters and excellent world building. The power of Lynn's writing and vision propels the narrative to a conclusion that leaves the reader gasping for more. And finally, but not the least, Dadaji's Paintbrush by Rashmi Sudesh Pandey. <laughs> Illustrated by Ruchi Masane is a beautifully touching book about feelings and overcoming grief. It hits all the emotions, and there isn't a single page that doesn't demand to be lingered over. So now, without further ado, let's move to announcing our two winners. First, the Jalak Children's and Young Adult Prize, 2023. Our judges said, this book stands out for its craft, courage, and connection. Powerfully written with memorable characters and tight plotting, 
This is a story that stays with the reader long after the last page. Our 2023 winner is Danielle Jawando. <laughs> For when our worlds collided. Thank you. I'm just going to keep it very, very short and sweet because I know nobody likes speeches. Um, but I just wanted to say how much this award means to me. Like, it honestly means so much. And I lost a lot of confidence in myself writing this first book. And I wrote it during the pandemic. Um, and I found it so difficult. So it's even more special that I've won it. Um, I just want to say a huge congratulations to all the other kind of shortlisted and longlisted authors as well because the list is just truly incredible. And just a huge thanks to SNS and my amazing editor, Amina, who really kind of helped to turn this book into something truly special. Um, huge thank you as well to my agent, Chloe, who helped me through so many meltdowns over this book um, and who's just always been there for me. And also to um, two of my favorite uh, people, Sam and Alex, who have just constantly kept me going when I've had kind of self-doubt as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. A little off script, but I'm so glad to finally meet Danielle because she was, she was um, on our list for our inaugural Children's and YA Prize. And just an incredible writer. Um, and finally, um, now to the winner of the Chalak Prize 2023. Our judges said, this book has a reflective quality that touches the heart and engages the mind. It is thoughtful, full of compassion and wit, and with a voice that is powerfully engaging and honest. This is the book we want to push into every reader's hands. Our winner, for Chalak Prize 2023 is Travis Alabanza. <laughs> for none of the above. Travis, Travis cannot be here with us today as they're overseas, but they have sent us a message. So please. Hi everyone. It's Travis. I am so sad that I can't be there to receive this award in person um, for two reasons. One, I knew I would have pulled an amazing outfit for an award ceremony. But two, this award really does mean so much to me. And if I wasn't in another continent right now, I would be doing everything I could to be there. When I decided to write none of the above, it was a really terrifying process because I looked out onto the bookshelves and I saw that there was not really any books written by gender non-conforming people of colour, trans people of colour, front and centre, in Waterstones, in these bookstores. And I knew that I wanted to change that. But what's scary is you are shown the type of book that you think you have to write. That is a book that teaches people how to be better allies, that packages up transness and our identities into these neat boxes. And for me, none of the above was about asking more questions than answering them. I wanted to archive my doubt and hope that through archiving the experience of doubt and the experience of being gender non-conforming, people could learn more about the world and myself around me. And it's been amazing because I always wanted to have a book that didn't just speak to the LGBTQ community, but also spoke to our experiences as LGBTQ people of colour. So to be given an award that is specifically for writers of colour means so much, really. Already from being on the long list and the short list, the amount of readers that have found my book now is so incredible. It makes me so happy because I wrote it for us. I wrote it for our communities and it means a lot to see those words reach those places. Um, I'm already going on loads, but I just want to say that this isn't possible without my incredible publishers at Canongate and my agent, Philippa. Um, thank you for sticking it out and waiting for me to come up with the right book. Thank you, Canongate, for never pressuring me to write a certain type of book. 
but instead letting me be the author that I wanted to be. Um, a big special thank you to my first editor on the book, Hannah Knowles, who was so, so incredible throughout this process. And also to Anna Frame, who was amazing during the publicity as well. It could not have been done without the whole team. Um, thank you to the Jalak Prize. This is such a meaningful and unforgettable moment for me. And yeah, I'm just really emotional about it. So thank you so much. And I hope you all have a good night. Karen, can I get you up here to hand over the, the wonderful piece of work? Diane couldn't be here with us, which is why I think she, she escaped this process. So this is Sharon. Sharon, I, I just, we discovered Sharon because she did the cover for Nicola Rollick's uh, amazing book called The Racial Code, which is just exquisite. And when we asked her to create um, this year's trophy, she created this. So, <laughs> Philippa, Hannah. Finally, for our online viewers, apologies for the glitches, but I hope you enjoyed the madness. Um, we're a bit rough and ready on this, on this prize, and I think you got a taste of that. Um, but as we bring the evening to a close for our online viewers, we remind you that beyond our annual long lists, short lists, and winners, every book submitted to the Jalak Prize is an act of disruption, defiance, challenge, and subversion. Each one of these books that is submitted to us is a victory. Each one is part of a movement to excavate and rediscover our pasts, to examine, challenge, and resist the present, and imagine bright new futures. For that, we are grateful to every writer who is working away at creating stories that we all need to hear. A huge thank you to all of you. Those who are in the room, do stay on. I know DJ Shy Guy has, has music and there's more, more alcohol to go around. There's also non-alcoholic material over at the bar. And those at home, thank you for joining us. Thank you and good night.